we have psychological illnesses and they seem to be very closely related to jinn possession what do we have to say about this? we have to accept the reality of psychological illnesses there are many people today who everything is jinn everything is jinn possession, everything is magic everything is evil eye and they are people who have this like su'adhan of everybody they just have this low estimation they're always suspicious of people I have a backache, somebody's done magic on me I have a headache, it must be evil eye my eye is twitching, it must be jinn so we as people we have to accept that medically there are psychological illnesses but psychological illnesses they have their symptoms and jinn possession has very clear symptoms so for example uh, as for a psycho psychological illness then it may be that when you recite Quran over this person they don't have a big reaction but if the person is possessed when you recite Quran over this person there's definitely going to be a big reaction there's going to be a big reaction whether that be shaking, crying, laughing uh, they, they may begin sweating you know things out of the ordinary are going to start happening psychological illnesses they are widely misunderstood if you go to a non-Muslim doctor who doesn't even believe in Allah do we think he's going to believe in the jinn? of course he's not therefore he will never accept that this may be something to do with jinn they will labor this person he has bipolar he is schizophrenic you know and put him on very very strong uh, medicines which sedate the brain they lower the brain activity but subhanallah it may be jinn possession I've had cases where for example one auntie she was possessed for 30 years for 30 years she was playing as a young girl as a 20 year old girl she was playing outside of uh, of a Sikh place of worship I think it's a I think it's a Gurdwara I think they call it a Gurdwara she was playing outside there as a young 20 year old girl the jinn fell in love with her and possessed her for 30 years she'd been taking uh, mental uh, sort of should we say antipsychotics medicines and subhanallah 30 years later we went to do ruqya on her and the jinn spoke up and said I've been in her body for 30 years so we have to accept psychological illnesses but at the same time we have to accept the Quranic cure and that jinn possession magic evil eye is a reality how do we how do we sort of differentiate between that which is our own mistake our own uh, you know our own decree from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I haven't got a job I lost my job I made this decision I started the business it failed etc how do we differentiate between that and uh, like a jinn possession or something more ominous or should we say external influences firstly it's important to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran do or does mankind think that they will be left to say amanna we believe and they will not be tested Allah says indeed we tested those who came before and Allah will make, those, make known those who are truthful from those who are liars so we have to know that the second that we stand up for Tawheed and we believe you are going to be tested this is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you claim that you believe in Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to test you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may test you through your health may test you through your wealth your children your lifestyle your, your deen whatever it may be so we have to know that this dunya Allah is the one who created death and life to test which one of you is best in terms of your actions so this life is a test so we are going to make mistakes we are going to fail we are going to have successes and we are going to have through our own mistakes we are going to have uh, failures as well as for that which is caused by external circumstances then it all comes down to knowledge if we have knowledge of the symptoms if we have knowledge of the signs and symptoms that this may be something external then subhanallah we then can seek a cure but we shouldn't without any knowledge just blame everything on magic I started a business I wasn't qualified I didn't have enough funds it fails it was bound to fail from the from the beginning and now I say this is magic no I never took the necessary precautions I never tied my camel but subhanallah I'm highly qualified I'm you know I have good character I have good references I'm experienced but I still can't find a job I've been trying for years and years and years everything seems to be going okay just as I'm about to sign the contract to start my job 
something happens all the time. I'm just using this as an example. Now we may think, mm, okay, maybe there's some external influences. So to summarize the answer, we have to understand success and failure is going to happen in this life. Tests are going to come our way. But it's only when there are some other signs and, you know, signs and symptoms of external influences that we should begin to become suspicious of magic. We should not always run to magic first. Rather, we should think, what am I doing? What am I doing? Have, you know, did I take the correct approach? It's something to do with myself. And then if there's external influences, then we can begin to look at those bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. The recitation of Qur'an burns the jinn. How about those people or those jinn who have uh, sort of entered into a person? Does it burn them when they are still in the body but they have accepted Islam? So there are some cases where the jinn accepts Islam but then is not able to leave the body. Either because the sahir, the magician, has sent other jinn to enforce the contract or there are other jinn who are waiting and they, subhanallah, I have cases where the jinn says, look, I want to leave, but they have my family. If I leave, they're going to kill my family. If I don't fulfill the mission, they're going to kill my family. So this is a reality, ikhwan. But what we advise the jinn at that stage, look, put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Put your trust in Allah jalla wa ala and leave. Allah will protect you. Allah knows your situation. And even if they have your family, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you. So in answer to the sister's question, yes, it still does burn them when they are in the person's body. So for as long as the jinn is in the person's body, Muslim or non-Muslim, the Quran will still burn that person. And this is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if the Quran, when they accepted Islam, it didn't have any effect, then subhanallah, it would, they would accept Islam and then they just sit in that person's body and you'd never be able to get that jinn out. So it's a blessing from Allah that the Qur'an, it does burn the jinn, whether they are Muslim or non-Muslim, for as long as they are possessing that person. Okay, Juan, I'm going to speak about sihr now. Um, it's a topic which I think, subhanAllah, there's a lot of, um, again, a lot of misunderstanding about. And let's start by looking at what sihr is. Is magic mentioned in the Qur'an? Because unfortunately there are those people who call themselves Muslim and yet they don't accept the reality of magic. They say magic is just hocus pocus, Harry Potter, it's not real. So they don't accept the reality of magic. So I want to mention now in the Quran, one of the main places where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions magic. In Surah Al-Baqarah, it's the 102nd ayah of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاتَّبَعُوا مَا تَتْلُوا الشَّيَاطِينُ عَلَى مُلْكِ سُلَيْمَانِ وَمَا كَفَرَ سُلَيْمَانُ وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ كَفَرُوا يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسَ السِّحْرَ وَمَا أُنزِلَ عَلَى الْمَلَكَيْنِ بِبَابِلَ هَارُوتَ وَمَارُوتَ وَمَا يُعَلِّمَانِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ حَتَّى يَقُولَ إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ فِتْنَةٌ فَلَا تَكْفُرْ فَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ مِنْهُمَا مَا يُفَرِّقُونَ بِهِ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَزَوْجِهِ وَمَا هُمْ بِضَارِينَ بِهِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ مَا يَضُرُّهُمْ وَلَا يَنْفَعُهُمْ وَلَقَدْ عَلِمُوا لَمَنْ اشْتَرَاهُ مَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقٍ وَلَا بِئْسَ مَا شَرَوْا بِهِ أَنفُسَهُمْ لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ I mentioned this whole ayah in Arabic because for anybody who's interested in doing ruqya this is one of the starting points of sihr this is the, the ayah which you start with when you suspect that somebody has magic done on them. You start with this ayah. And the second that you start reciting this ayah, the person is going to have a reaction with the permission of Allah. I'll mention the translation now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And they followed what the devils had recited during the reign of Sulaiman alayhi salam. So during the reign of Sulaiman alayhi salam, some devils were teaching this knowledge. But Allah says, وَمَا كَفَرَ سُلَيْمَانِ وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ كَفَرُوا Sulaiman did not disbelieve. But the shayateen, the devils, they disbelieved. They taught knowledge, they taught magic, that which was revealed to the two angels of uh, Babylon, Harut wa Marut. And then Allah says, But the two angels did not teach anybody this knowledge, this magic. حَتَّى يَقُولَا إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ fitna." Until they said, We are a trial. فَلَا تَكْفُرْ Don't disbelieve by learning this magic. So let's put this all together now. Two angels descend and they teach people magic. Now we may be thinking, why are angels who can only worship Allah 
Why are angels teaching people magic, which is disbelief? Because the angels said, before they taught anybody this knowledge, they said, look, we are a trial from Allah. This magic is a trial for you people. If you learn it, you will have disbelieved. So don't learn it from us. But if the people, they persisted, then the angels would teach them this ma magic. So this magic was sent down as a trial, ikhwani. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and they learn from these two, from these shayateen, that by which they seek to separate a man from his wife. So this is one of the purposes of magic, is to separate a husband from his wife. Separate a husband from his wife. This is one of the greatest and most destructive aims of the magician. Because if you separate a husband from his wife, you break up two families, you keep a father away from his children, you ruin the life of a man, you ruin the life of a woman and the children as well. It ruins society. So this is one of the main purposes of magic. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and they learn that which harms them and it doesn't benefit them. So Ikhwani, an important point, learning magic, it harms you and it does not benefit you. It brings you no benefit in dunya, it brings you no benefit in akhirah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and they knew that whoever has any share of magic has no portion in the akhirah. So if you pay for magic, if you learn magic, if you support magic, if you spread magic, you have no share in the akhirah. You have disbelieved by having something to do with magic. Allah says, وَلَا بِئْسَ مَا شَرَوْ بِهِ أَنفُسَهُمْ لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ what an evil price it is for that which they have sold their own souls, if only they knew. So you know when people say, I, this person has sold his soul to the devil, this is literally what the magician has done. He has sold his soul to the devil and Allah says, what an evil price it is for which he has sold his own soul, if only he knew. So you have no portion in the Akhirah. Anything to do with magic is disbelief. Other places in the Qur'an, in Surah Al-A'raf, Surah Yunus, Surah Taha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the magicians at the time of Fir'aun. The magicians at the time of Fir'aun. So Musa, at the time of Fir'aun and Musa. So Musa alayhi salam, he goes to Pharaoh, he goes to Fir'aun, and he says, look, let the people, let the children of Israel, let the Jews come with me, and I'm going to show you a sign. So he takes his hand out of his pocket and it's shining like the sun. Fir'aun says, Musa, you are a magician. You are a magician and we can bring magicians who will defeat you. So Musa he says, okay, bring your magicians. So now we have like a showdown. We have the magicians of Pharaoh who have learnt magic all of their life. And now we have Musa. So the magicians say, oh Moses, oh Musa, are you going to throw your staff or are we going to throw? So Musa alayhi salam, he says, you throw. So the magicians, they throw down their ropes and they bewitch the eyes of the people. They do this type of magic which bewitches the eyes of the people into thinking that they see something which they don't. So the people, they think that the, the, the ropes of the magicians, they are like snakes. They are like snakes moving. فَأَوْجَسَ فِي نَفْسِهِ خِيفَةً مُوسَى Musa alayhi salam, when he sees this, he begins to feel fear in his heart. They are like snakes. They, they, their ropes are moving like snakes. Allah says, don't fear. قُلْنَا لَا تَخَفْ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْأَعْلَى We said to Musa, don't fear, O Musa, you are going to be victorious. And then Allah says, throw that which is in your right hand. And Musa alayhi salam, he throws his rope. It becomes a real snake and it eats the snakes of the magicians. And then, فَأُلْقِيَ السَّحَرَةُ سُجَّدَ The magicians, they fall into prostration. And they say, we believe in the Lord of Harun and Musa. They become Muslims. Because the magicians, Ikhwani, they knew that what we are doing, this is only magic. They're not really snakes. This is bewitching the eyes of the people. But when Musa alayhi salam, he throws his stuff down, the magicians recognize, this is not magic, he is a prophet of Allah. So they say, we believe in the Lord of Harun and Musa. So they become Muslims. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this magic in the Quran. Did you know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had magic practiced on him? Somebody did magic on the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The hadith is in Sahih Muslim and in Sahih Bukhari, narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha. She says, a spell, magic was put on the messenger until he imagined that he had done something when he hadn't really done it. I want to stop here and, th and say, what did he imagine that he had done and he hadn't actually done it? The scholars they mention, and Aisha radiallahu anha, she mentions, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam would wake up at fajr time. He would do a ghusl. And this was not from his sunnah. He wouldn't wake up and do a ghusl for no reason. So Aisha radiallahu anha would ask, why are you doing a ghusl, O Messenger of Allah? Why are you making a major, you know, a major ghusl? Why are you taking a bath? He would say, we had intercourse last night. So she would say, no, we didn't. So this is what Aisha radiallahu anha is mentioning. When she says, he would imagine that he had done something, but he hadn't done it. So he had imagined that he had slept with his wives, but he hadn't actually done it. So the hadith continues. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is mentioned in this hadith. Aisha radiallahu anha, she says, one day he made dua. Again, he made dua. What was he doing? He was making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He didn't take Quran, put it in an amulet, in a ta'weez, in a ta'weez and put it around his neck. He never put Quran on his wall. He never put Quran, uh, you know, in his car or on his riding beast. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he turned to Allah directly and he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So she says, one day he made dua and then he said, do you know that Allah has shown me where my cure lies? As a result of his dua, he turns to Aisha radiallahu anha, our mother, and he says, do you know that Allah has shown me where my cure lies? And then he says, two men came to me. This is the messenger of Allah saying this. Two men came to me and one of them sat at my head and one of them sat at my feet. What is ailing this man? I want you to picture the scene. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is lying down. Two men come down and they are angels. Two men come down and they are angels. One stands at the head of the messenger alayhi salam. One stands at his feet and now they begin to have a conversation. But Allah has allowed the messenger to witness their conversation. Does everybody understand this? So the angels are having a conversation between themselves, but the Prophet ﷺ is witness to their conversation. So one stands at his head and one stands at his feet. And one of them said to the other, what is wrong with this man? Referring to the messenger ﷺ. The other says, he has been bewitched. He has magic done on him. So one asks the question, this angel asks this one, what's wrong with him? The other one says, he's got magic done on him. And then the other one says, who has bewitched him? Who's done this magic? And then the name is mentioned, Labid ibn al-A'sam, who was a Jewish man. The angel says, what has he done magic with? With what has the magic been done? And then the other one says, with a comb, the hair that is stuck to it, and the stick and the skin of a pollen of a male date palm. The Prophet ﷺ used to comb his beard. Sometimes when you comb your beard, hair from your beard gets tangled around your comb. The Prophet ﷺ, he dropped his comb. The man, the Jewish man, took the comb of the Messenger ﷺ. He tied the hair into knots and he did magic on the hair of the Prophet ﷺ. And he took this hair and he put it into the bottom of a well. This is how magic was done on the messenger alayhi salatu salam. Then the other man said, where is it? And then the other angel replied, it is in the well of Darwan. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he went out to this well. In another narration, he sent Ali radiallahu an to this well. And then he came back and he said, Aisha, oh Aisha, its date palms are like the heads of devils. And then Aisha said, oh messenger of Allah, did you take this? Did you take the magic out? Did you take the magic out and show the people? The Prophet ﷺ said, No, Allah has healed me and I feared that it might bring evil. It might cause fitna. If the people see it, it might cause fitna. Maybe they will say the Prophet ﷺ has, has magic done on him. The Quran has now been corrupted. Because the Quran comes down to him, he doesn't remember. The Quran has been corrupted. 
But ikhwani, a point of our aqidah. Allah says, we have sent down this Qur'an, we will protect it. So it's upon Allah to protect the Qur'an. So when the Prophet ﷺ had magic done on him, the Qur'an was not affected. The Qur'an was not corrupted because it is upon Allah to protect the Qur'an from any deviation, any mistakes or anything like this. So the Prophet ﷺ, he had magic done upon him. Ikhwani, the scholars have defined this word sihar as that which is caused by hidden or subtle forces. So I want you to imagine you're standing outside in a field and there is a cool breeze, it is blowing. You can feel the breeze, but can you see the breeze? No. So you feel the effects of the sihar, but you can't quite put your finger on it. What is it? What's wrong with me? But you can't quite put your finger on it. So it's a hidden, subtle force. It's not something apparent. It's something hidden and something subtle. But it becomes apparent by ruqya, by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jundub ibn Ka'b. He narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, the prescribed punishment for the magician is that he should be executed by the sword. This is the shari, uh, the shari punishment for the magician. He be executed by the sword. Ikhwani, whenever I give this talk, I have to give a disclaimer. Please don't go around chopping people's heads off. You don't like your neighbor, so you go and cut his head off, and then you say he was a magician. No. The prescribed punishment is to take his head off by the sword in an Islamic court. Once the proofs and evidences have been brought against this individual, we leave it to the rulers, we, re we leave it to those in authority to conduct this punishment. Imagine the fitna and facade that would spread if each and every single one of us went around and we, whenever we suspected somebody was, was a magician, we just took his head off. There'd be too much fitna and facade. We leave it to those in authority. They will bring the proofs and evidences, establish the proof against this individual, and then the shari punishment is that he should have his head removed from his shoulders. Because of this hadith, it's narrated that Umar radiallahu an, this is in Sahih Bukhari, he, narrate, he wrote to all of the commanders of the Muslims. So when he was the Khalifa, when he was the Khalifa of the time, he was the ruler, he wrote to the Muslim commanders in all of the Muslim lands, saying, behead every practitioner of magic. And the Abu Uthman and Nahdi, a companion, he says, we executed three practitioners of witchcraft. We executed three practitioners of witchcraft. And it's narrated that Hafsa, she executed a female slave of hers because she found out that she was engaging in witchcraft. I want to imagine now, I want you to imagine now, so we've bought Dalil, we've bought proofs and evidences from Quran. Allah says they have disbelieved by learning magic. They have sold their souls. They have no share in the Akhirah. The Prophet ﷺ has said we need to take their heads off. Now I want to mention some of the understanding of the companions. Because part of us as Muslims, we as Muslims, we follow the Qur'an and the Sunnah with the understanding of the companions. Not with my understanding, not with your understanding, but with the understanding of the companions. A great event takes place. Jundub ibn Abdullah radiallahu an. He is a great companion. He's sitting there the way you guys are sitting here now, and there's a magician on stage. The magician takes his head off, and he rolls his head down his arm. And then he rolls it back up, puts his head back on, rolls it back down, puts it back up, and puts it back onto his shoulders. Jundub ibn Abdullah radiallahu an walks up, walks onto the stage, takes his sword out, and chops his head off, and says, put your head back on if you are truthful. Put your head back on if you are truthful. Of course, he's not able to do that because he is dead. Rather, he had bewitched the eyes of the people into believing that he was playing with his head. From here, we have the ruling of illusionary magic. Those people who, we have Dynamo, we have David Blaine, we have this type of people, they look like they are walking on the, on the, on the, on the River Thames in London, etc. Illusionary magic is haram. Illusionary magic is haram to practice, it is haram to watch. We as Muslims, my dear brothers and sisters, we love what Allah loves. We love what the Messenger loves. We hate what Allah and His Messenger hates. Indeed, magic is hated to Allah and His Messenger. It should be hated to us as Muslims. We should not watch and we should not allow our children to watch 
that which Allah and the Messenger alayhi salam hate. So we stay away from this. Incidentally, after Jundub radiallahu an took his head off, the governor at that area of that area, he imprisoned Jundub. He put him in prison. News reached Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an, the great Sahabi of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Uthman ibn Affan wrote to the governor and said, release Jundub for indeed he has done well. So this is how the companions, they understood magic and those who practice magic. I want to mention, Ikhwani, some of the contemporary scholars. What do they have to say about the practitioner of magic? Sheikh, Sheikh Ibn Baz, rahimahullah, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, rahimahullah, they said, if the person, he is a practitioner of magic, and we catch him, and then he says, I have made tawbah, I have made tawbah, we say to this individual, your tawbah is between you and Allah. As for in the dunya, we have to kill you. We have to carry out the prescribed punishment because of the mischief and the fitna and the fasad and the evilness that you have spread in the land. So your tawbah is between you and Allah. As for us, we have to carry out the prescribed punishment. Why do they say this? I mentioned to you the evil nature of the magician. It's very easy for him to say, Astaghfirullah, I have made tawbah. When in reality, he is a hypocrite. When in reality, he is somebody who is worshipping shaitan. So we say, if you are sincere, your tawbah is between you and Allah, perhaps it will benefit you. As for us in the dunya, we have to take your head off because we have found you practicing magic. So ikhwani, it's extremely, extremely important. It's extremely dangerous. I want to mention now some different types of sihr, some different types of magic. So for example, the brother, he may be considering a sister who has problems and she has magic done on her. So he starts to consider her. But the second that he starts to consider her, problems start in his life. The shayateen, they begin to attack him. So for example, I had one case where the family would wake up and there was blood on the walls. They would wake up in their home and there's blood on the walls and their names are written in blood. Fresh blood and the blood is fresh and is dripping and yet they don't know where it came from. Blood on their doors, blood on their walls, blood on their clothes. Because the shayateen are trying to make this man think, you know, the problem only started when I considered this sister. And then he will pack away and he will move away from the sister and then his problems will stop. Until the next man comes, he considers the same sister and the problems start in his life. So this is one of those ways. The second way is that the sister or the brother will never find anybody good, enough for her. So for example, a brother comes, he has good deen, good character, he, he has a good job, but the sister just does not find him attractive, except the brother's okay, he's not, you know, he's not unattractive, but the sister will not find anybody who she likes. So this is one of the ways of uh, pe you know, keeping people away from magic, away from getting married. Another type of magic is that type of magic which it blocks your rizq, it blocks your, your earnings and it prevents a person from getting a job, it prevents a person from, from seeking a, a halal earning etc. So for example, you may have somebody who's very very wealthy, he's very successful and it always happens, and I'm not stigmatizing anybody here, but it always happens with those people who have links with Asian countries, links with Arabian countries. Why? Because this is where most of the magic comes from. This is where most of the magic comes from. They have their Bir Saab, their Baba Saab, whatever it is, in Pakistan, in India, in Asia, in Egypt, in Morocco. And so they will send money to him, and it's like, you know, it's like a first class delivery service, the magic arrives at your door and then you go and you put this magic on the food etc. You send the food around and I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. And subhanallah, this is out of jealousy, out of hatred, out of envy, out of not being happy with the decree of Allah. Why does he have that and I don't have that? Why is he successful and I'm not successful? Why are his children going through university? Mine are not. Out of this hatred, they want to destroy a person's earnings. There is another type of magic, Ikhwani, which is just to destroy a person. Just the sole purpose is to destroy that person's life and to get them to A, die or B, to commit suicide. I want to narrate to you, and I always mention this story because 
it's a story which has the doctors bemused. A sister comes to me and she says, I had two weeks to live. The doctors gave me two weeks to live. And I said, why? They said, because, she said, because they told me that my heart efficiency rate had dropped to 5%. My heart was only 5% efficient and they said, there's no way you're going to survive. You have days or even a couple of weeks to live at most. This was seven or eight months ago after she started the Ruqya. When we started the Ruqya, the jinn told me, I sit in her back and I play with the valves of her heart and I prevent the blood from reaching certain areas of her heart. So when the doctors look at it and they do all their checks, to all their checks it seems like the sister has a heart problem. Where in actual reality, it's a jinn which is playing with her heart. And this jinn, subhanAllah, it's an amazing story because this jinn, it had been there for 15 years, the jinn accepted Islam and it left the body of the sister, walhamdulillah. So, we have these type of things and the jinn's mission was simply to get this sister to die. It was trying and it was trying and it was trying. But this sister was a woman of Tawheed, this sister knew the Sunnah, she prayed five times a day. But she was a person like this, so the jinn never had the ability to do that. And a point of Aqeedah, Ikhwani, my dear brothers and sisters, life and death is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those doctors, for all intents and purposes, they were convinced. When the sister went back six months later, they said it's impossible that you are still alive. It's impossible that you are still alive. There's no explanation for it whatsoever. There's no explanation for it whatsoever. Other types of sihar, and we've spoken about jinn, uh, I have a very good friend of mine who works in a psychiatric hospital and he tells me a story of how one sister, one girl, she hospitalized 45 men. 45 men were hospitalized, broken arms, broken legs, broken ankles because they were trying to restrain her and the sister was possessed and she was throwing them like they were just rag dolls. And this sister's five foot two. She's a small woman and yet she had this immense strength. And like I mentioned, the jinn, when it comes to physical strength, they are much stronger than us. But when we recite Qur'an on them, even for five minutes, they become extremely weak. Extremely weak. So for example, if the Shaykh there was to punch me now, it would hurt. But if there was that same person and they were possessed and you did Ruqya on them and then they punched you, it would hurt like with the force of a child. Because the jinn has been burnt so much with Qur'an, it doesn't have the same level of strength. So you can restrain an individual with just one hand. You can restrain a big man. This, this brother, he was a, a stone lifter and he was six foot five and I'm not very big. And we restrained him with one hand. We got him down with one hand. And this is simply because of the recitation of Quran has made this person so very weak. And it's the shaitan now has made him extremely weak. Another type of magic is to try and mislead an individual. So the shaitan will come and will try and take this person away from deen, take this person away from practicing Islam to try and destroy him. I want to mention now, removing sihar or going to, to a magician, how do you actually, you know, what's the, what's the practical way of, of putting magic on an individual? Just so that you brothers and sisters know. A brother came to me and he said, my... My grandmother has passed away and upon clearing her things away from her room, it turns out she used to practice magic. She had books of magic in her room. So they showed me this book and I actually still have this book but not with me. Um, in this book, the person says this is how you do magic. So I'll give you an example of magic. He says take some pork, a big chop of pork, pig. Take a big portion of uh, beef and leave the two meats, the two types of meat, leave them outside to rot. Leave them outside to rot. And then he says maggots will form and one form, one of the maggots, one of the groups of maggots will eat the other. He said the maggots that then remain, take them, place them into a blender, blend them down into a powder and then recite your magic on this and then sprinkle this powder onto the food of the individual and give them to eat. This is one of the ways that, we, that they practice magic. Another type of way that they practice magic is like we mentioned about the Messenger salam. The magician will always say, give me, uh, for example, a, a hair. 
give me a photograph, give me an item of their clothing, give me uh, a, a, maybe a piece of their underwear, give me something by which I can recognize this person. How does this work? You may have seen the police programs where the criminal runs into a, uh, into like a forest, he runs into a wooded area, so the police bring the police dogs, the sniffer dogs, and they make the dog sniff one of his shirts, or an item of his clothing, or they get a piece of his trail, the dog goes into the rainforest, or into the forest, in pitch black, and he finds the individual. This is the same thing with the, with the, with the magician. He needs a trail. He needs something like an item of your clothing, a uh, part of your beard hair, something by which the jinn can recognize you. He will do the magic on that, and through that, the jinn now has a trail, the same way the sniffer dog has a trail. Goes and finds that individual. The jinn knows now, this is the individual that I need to find. This is my mission. And it goes and it carries out that mission. Another way that they will do magic is like we mentioned, they will take, um, they will take uh, sort of uh, the, the, the organs of an animal, usually a liver, usually a kidney, something which contains a lot of blood. And then they will do their magic over this and they will bury this in a graveyard. Out of all of the forms of magic, this is the most difficult magic to treat because it's been buried in a graveyard. Now, do you then go and start digging up graves and when somebody asks you, you say, I'm looking for magic? No. So this is the most difficult type of magic. And this type of magic, it can only be removed by reciting continuously until the jinn dies until the jinn dies. Because if you can find the knots, you can undo them and the jinn will leave. If you can find the da'weed or the da'weez, you can find it, you can burn it, you can destroy it, you can recite on it and it will get better and, and the person will get better. But how do you when you are sitting in Dubai or you are sitting in the UK and the magic is in a graveyard in Bangladesh or in Pakistan or in Morocco or Egypt, how do you find the magic? It's impossible. It's impossible to find the magic in that instance you just keep reciting and keep burning and keep burning the jinn until he realizes either I leave or I'm going to die. Either I leave or I am going to die. I want to mention now how to get rid of these amulets. Firstly, let's talk about these amulets. Let's talk about da'weez. Let's talk about these uh, talismans and amulets. What is their position in Islam? Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu an, he narrates that 10 men came to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They wanted to offer the Pledge of Allegiance. They wanted to take the bay'ah. They wanted to become Muslim and, and protect the Messenger alayhi salatu salam. The Prophet alayhi salam accepted the Pledge of Allegiance from nine men, but he never accepted from one man. The man was wearing a da'weed. He was wearing an amulet around his neck. He takes the amulet off he breaks it and then he gives the Pledge of Allegiance and the Messenger السلام, accepts his Pledge of Allegiance and then the Prophet وسلم, says clear words whoever wears an amulet has committed shirk clear words whoever wears an amulet has committed shirk in another narration a man he is wearing something around his arm the Prophet السلام, says what is that why are you wearing it the man says I'm suffering from this disease and it's called alwahina it's like uh, arthritis it's a disease of the bones and I'm wearing this and it's like people wear these copper bracelets today thinking that they're going to benefit them, there's going to do some effect on their bones or something like this and it brings some benefit. The man was wearing it around his arm. The Prophet ﷺ said, take it off for it can only increase your weakness and were you to die whilst wearing it, you would never be successful. You would never be successful. It's only going to increase your weakness. Do you truly think that this thing which is tied around your arm is going to benefit you? Do you truly think that this thing which is tied around your arm is going to protect you? It's extremely, uh, extremely important, Ikhwani, that we stay away from these things. The great companion Hudayfa radiallahu an, he sees a man wearing this. He sees a man wearing this. And then he says, you know, if you died whilst you were wearing this, I wouldn't have offered the funeral prayer for you. I wouldn't have prayed your janazah. Why? Because I would have considered you to be a kafir. Ikhwani, it's extremely important. People of Tawheed, we don't need to tie something around our neck. We rather, we recite Quran. We place our trust in Allah. We, we do all the necessary steps 
from the sunnah of the Prophet He was afflicted with magic. Did he tie anything around his neck? No, by Allah he did not. He was afflicted with magic. Did he tie anything around his waist? As we have our sisters, they go to Peace Sub and say, Peace Sub, give me a baby. Peace Sub says, tie this thing around your neck, you'll have a baby. A'udhu billah min dhalik. Ikhwani, people of Tawheed, we rely solely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. I want to mention now how to spot a magician. How do we spot somebody who is a magician? It doesn't matter how long his beard is, doesn't matter how short his thobe is, doesn't matter how much mandi he has in his beard. How do we spot the magician? How do we spot this magician, Ikhwani? The first thing is that when you go to this magician, he is somebody, he asks for your name, he asks for your date of birth, he asks for an item of your clothing, he asks for a photograph of you, he asks for your mother's name, your father's name, he asks for your lineage. Common sense, my dear brothers and sisters, if you are going to heal me with Quran and Sunnah, why do you need to know my mother's name? Why do you need an item of my clothing? Why do you need a photograph of me? I'm standing right in front of you. So Ikhwani, this is the first thing. The second thing, he will not recite out loud. He will never, the magician will never recite out loud. Ruqya Ikhwani is that which we recite out aloud. So you should know exactly what I am reciting. The brother is reciting Surah Al-Fatiha. He's reciting Ayatul Kursi. Ikhlas, Falaq, Nas. You know exactly what I am reciting. Whereas the magician, he will mumble things under his breath. How do you know that he's calling on Allah? How do you know that he's not calling on Shaytan? How do you know he's not calling on Shaytan? The third thing, the magician, he is somebody, Ikhwani, I had a sister ring me. And she says, my father practices magic. We opened his mushaf, we opened his copy of the Qur'an. Inside his mushaf, he had magic. So when he would carry his, magic, his mushaf around, it looked like he was reciting Qur'an. Turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. Follow the sunnah of the messenger alayhi salatu salam. Why are we turning to these means which nullify our Islam? So the question is posed. I have, I have this thing around my neck. And it's benefiting me. I was suffering and as soon as I put it on, I got better. How do you explain this? You are saying it's haram, but I have benefited from it. I use the example of a dog because the messenger alayhi salatu salam, he told us that some of the jinn, they can take the form of black dogs. If there is a dog which is barking, if there is a dog which is barking and you throw the dog some meat, of course the dog is going to stop barking. But as soon as the dog gets hungry again, it's going to bark louder, more ferociously, because it knows when I bark at this individual, he gives me what I want. Ikhwani, the dog is the jinn. What is the plot and the plan of shaitan? The plot and the plan, let's look holistically, look at the bigger picture. The plot and the plan of shaitan is to take as many of us with him into the hellfire. This is his plot, this is his mission. Oh Allah, because you have led me astray, because you have sent me astray, I will mislead many of them and I will take them with me to the hellfire. Shaitan knows. Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bihi. Shaitan knows that Allah says he will never forgive the one who commits shirk. So if Shaitan can get you to commit shirk, another one bites the dust. So. The jinn is giving you problems. The second you put this amulet on, the jinn which was giving you problems, stops giving you problems. You have fallen into shirk. You have done what they wanted you to do. You have fed them that meat. You have fed them that meat, now it leaves you alone. But the second that you take it off, you place your trust in Allah, it's going to come back worse. It's going to be worse for you. Because you've taken 10 steps backwards, now you need to retrace your steps. Before you can make any progress, you have to undo the damage that you've already done to yourself. So this is why I always say to my brothers and sisters in Islam, it may be tempting that somebody will say to you, give me 50, uh, 50 dirhams, give me 500 dirhams. I will give you something, I promise it will make you better. But my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, there is no quick cure. 
There is no fast cure. You will put this on, you will get better. If you die whilst you wear it, you will never be successful, as the Messenger ﷺ said. If you take it off, then know that the jinn are going to give you more trouble than when they started. Because now they know if we give this person trouble, it's likely that he will fall back into shirk. So it's extremely important, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, we seek the Qur'anic cure, we follow the sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we do not seek other means, weird and wonderful means which are not from the sunnah because ultimately a short-term gain is going to give you long-term problems. Rather, we do it properly, we do it properly, we are in it for the long run and you will find bi Ta'ala you will be better than when you started. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from magic, to protect us from the magicians, to protect us from the shayateen. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to expose those magicians because they are in our communities. They may even be amongst us right now. They are in our communities, ikhwani. They are those deceivers. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to expose them and to give them a painful punishment in the dunya and in the akhirah subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk the second question is is iblis alive the question is absolutely yes when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expelled him from jannah iblis said oh allah let me live until yawm al qiyamah oh allah let me live until yawm al qiyamah and allah allah granted him that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let him live until Yawm al Qiyamah. And then this is where he said, Oh Allah, oh my Lord, because you have allowed me to go astray, I will mislead them, I will come to them and sit on your straight path. I will come from their right, from their right side, from their left side, from in front of them, from behind them, and you will find that most of them are not grateful. So Iblis is going to live until Yawm al Qiyamah, and then he will be thrown into the fire of Jahannam, where he will be Khalidina fiha abada. He will be in there forever and ever for all of eternity. So he will live until Yawm al Qiyamah. This is something specific for Iblis, though, not for the other shayateen. When we consider, uh, when we when we uh, hang up uh, ayahs of the Quran on our wall, etc., is this considered shirk? Of course not. We cannot say that the Quran is considered shirk. Rather, what this is is an innovation in the religion. This is an innovation in the religion because the Prophet ﷺ nor his companions, they did not do this. Rather, we have clear texts prohibiting this. So for example, those ahadith which I've mentioned to you, the Messenger ﷺ asked the person, why are you wearing it? Note, he never asked the person, what's inside of it? We have to make this distinguishing factor. Why are you wearing it? Is it jewelry? Is it like a decoration? No. He never asked the person, is there Quran in there? He still says, you should not wear it, take it off. So the point here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ Do they not have tadabbur? You know, will they not reflect and recite and ponder over this Qur'an? Ikhwani, this Qur'an is to be recited, it is to be implemented, it is to be lived by as our daily life guide. It is not to be hung up on our walls like wallpaper. This is disrespect of the Qur'an. This is disrespecting the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This Qur'an was sent down muttaqin, as a guidance for those who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it's on your walls and it's in your cars, etc. It's not going to be, this is not how the Messenger alayhi salatu salam, he used it. And I want to give one final example. If you go to the doctor and the doctor gives you a prescription and then you go and you put that prescription in your top pocket or around your neck, will it benefit you? Of course not. You have to use the prescription the way the doctor wanted you to use the prescription. And for Allah is the highest of all examples. I'm only giving you this so that you can try and understand. The Qur'an is to be used, to be recited, to be implemented, not to be tied around our necks or on our walls. And Allah knows best. You said that the jinns can possess Muslim brothers and sisters. For the sisters, you said inappropriate dressings, etc. What about Muslim brothers? How did they get possessed? Muslim brothers... Um, the, if you know, mashallah, tabarakallah, if the brother is fit and he goes to the gym, yani he stands in front of the mirror and he looks at himself and he admires himself and he doesn't say mashallah, tabarakallah, and he doesn't cover himself properly, so he's wearing improper clothing. When he takes his clothing off, he doesn't say bismillah. When he enters into the bathroom, he doesn't make the, the necessary du'as. When he puts his clothing on, he doesn't mention the necessary du'as. We'll mention this tomorrow, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, but they can fall in love with an individual. So the same way that the, the females, they fall in love with the males, the males can fall in love with the females. 
and Allah Musta'an, there is known for homosexuality amongst the shayateen as well. Uh, the sister asked a question uh, about, the, about the, the whisperings of shaitan. Are these a part of magic? No, Ikhwani, for example, it may be, it may be, but there's going to be other symptoms that come along with that. But it may be, but at the same time, we also have to know the Messenger alayhi salatu salam, he told us that when we, as soon as we say Allahu Akbar and we start our prayer, there is a type of jinn which comes and a, sh a type of shaitan which comes, begins to whisper in our ears, begins to whisper into our ears. How do we combat this? We just say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem, dry spit over our shoulder three times, not wet spit because you don't want to wet the brother next to you, you know, so it has to be dry spit. This is from the Sunnah. We, we, we seek refuge in Allah from shaitan, dry spit three times and this will expel the jinn by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for what is the cure for whisperings in aqidah, then no doubt the, the cure for ignorance or whisperings in aqidah is to seek knowledge of your aqidah. The stronger your knowledge of your aqidah, your fundamentals of your religion become, the more difficult it becomes for the shayateen to try and mislead you through that. So the fact that they, you are even having, having whisperings in your aqidah, this means that your aqidah is not strong enough. There should be no doubt in your aqidah, in our aqidah whatsoever. And Allah knows this. What about hypnosis and hypnotherapy? Is it also part of magic? Hypnosis and hypnotherapy, this is a very good question. It's a very, very, question, very, very good question. Hypno, hypnosis, so you see the individual, they, like the, the, the hypnotherapist, he sort of clicks his <coughs> fingers and the person falls into this trance. This is not permissible. It's absolutely haram. Does it fall into the same category as magic? Allahu alam. I'm not sure about this. As for how does hypnosis work, then it seems, as you all know, each and every single one of us has a qareen with us, has a, has a, a member from the shayateen with us, and he seeks to make us disobey Allah. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, but Allah has aided me against my qareen, he has accepted Islam, and now he only invites me to do good. This is for the Prophet ﷺ. So his qareen, his evil devil, became a Muslim, and encouraged him to do good. As for us, as for us lowly sinners, then our Qareen encourages us to do evil. And what it seems is how does hypnosis work? The, 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 the hypnotherapist, it seems he is working with the jinn. It seems he is working with the jinn, and when he is working with the jinn, the jinn which he is working with, his jinn, they make contact with the, your Qareen. They make contact with your Qareen, and your Qareen or his jinn, they take over. And then this is when you go into this state of hypnotherapy, of hypnosis, sorry. Is it permissible? Absolutely not. And something that I would love to do is to say to a, hypno, uh, to a hypnotherapist, go on, hypnotize me. But at the same time, you are reciting Ayatul Kursi, and I bet they wouldn't be able to do that. What about Christianity? What about Sikhism? How do their exorcisms work? Something to think about. How do their exorcisms work? Ikhwani, the principle is exactly the same. When they call upon Jesus, when they call upon the Holy Ghost, when they commit major shirk and major kufr, the jinn says, job done. Job done, now I can go. And the shaitan, the jinn, he knows that now this person, he's been to a priest, and so-called the priest has cured him by the Bible and he's called upon Jesus and Jesus has cured him. Now this person is going to be a more avid Christian than when it began. Because he's going to swear by it. He's going to say, this book is from God. Jesus is God because Jesus cured me. What he doesn't know is when he called upon Jesus, he committed major shirk, the jinn left, and now he is the one who is playing the fool. So it's extremely important, Ikhwani, that we recognize this. There. Uh, exorcisms do not work through Tawheed they do not work through the correctness of their books they work because they commit major shirk the same way that we have these people amongst us they say call upon Abdul Qadir Al Jilani call upon Sheikh this call upon Sheikh that when you do that you have left the fold of Islam and the jinn leaves you as well because you have done what he wanted you to do so Ikhwani Tawheed is the only way forward Tawheed is the only way forward can we do ruqya on the non-Muslims? Also, if he is possessed, would it affect him? Absolutely, ruqya works for the non-Muslim. The companions perform ruqya over a non-Muslim who was bitten by a scorpion. And uh, he was cured by the permission of Allah. And doing ruqya on a non-Muslim is the most amazing tool for da'wah. 
is the most amazing tool for da'wah because you recite over them and you say, look, this book, which is from Allah, you need to accept Islam because this book is not from me or from you. This book is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brother asks a good question. What about this magic which seemingly is redone? So it seems like I'm better now and then it seems that the magician has redone his magic. In 99.9 .9 cases, 99.9% .9 of cases, you didn't get rid of the magic in the first place. You didn't get rid of the magic in the first place. It's very, very rare, Akhi, that the, the magician will keep going back and keep doing it. Because unfortunately, magicians are extremely busy nowadays. And, and oh, this is the truth, uh, Ikhwan, they're extremely busy nowadays and they will literally, you know, charge thousands and thousands of pounds or even on the other side of the scale, hundreds of, uh, hundreds of rupees. Um, and they have so many people coming to them that this person won't keep going back to have the magic redone. In the vast majority of cases, uh, the magic was not uh, sort of, uh, so we say, disposed of correctly in the first place. So what I advise this person is to put a proper rukya plan in place to be uh, sort of, you know, be patient upon that and be steadfast upon that. With the permission of Allah, you will be cured. When somebody is afflicted by, by jinn or magic, the family plays a crucial part. Most times, the person who is afflicted won't want rukya. So it's upon the family to encourage them. It's upon the family to take them. It's upon the family to make that rukya. Because the person, part of the magic is that you're not going to accept that you have magic. Nobody wants to accept that I have magic performed over me. So it's very important. I always say, the rukya on a person, this is 30% of the battle. Dealing with the family is 70% of the battle. Why? Because unfortunately, due to uh, a lack of knowledge and a lot of ignorance amongst our communities, people are quick to run to peace up. But when you come and you start reciting Quran, they see this reaction and they say, look, when we went to the peace up, the person got better straight away. What are you doing? This person is screaming. My daughter is screaming. My daughter is clearly in a lot of pain. What they don't understand is that Rukya is a gradual thing. And so therefore, if the family are, are, are difficult, then many a time, I've been wanting to help an individual, but I've not been able to do so because their family have stopped me from getting to them. So uh, the family plays a very, very important role. So this is for the fathers, especially if you do have any children like this, be supportive. Be supportive, seek a cure from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and don't always turn to this is psychological illness, etc. As we'll mention tomorrow, the Quran is a cure for all of the illnesses. The Quran is a cure for all illnesses because Allah says We have sent down this Quran that which is a shifa and a mercy to the believers. So this Quran is a, is, is a healing for all illnesses. Use it that way. Please go and follow the ways of the Quran and the Sunnah. Don't follow somebody who will give you so-called fast results because fast results in the short term mean big problems in the long term. When we are speaking about Sihr, uh, there are certain sects of people uh, who are denying the reality of shahar. They are, uh, what do you say? They are uh, declaring that believing in the reality of shahar is a shirk because we are associating some other forces besides Allah. Means we are, you are believing in the some other forces besides Allah, and there are a uh, lot of people, especially in the southern parts of India, who are declaring that whoever believed the hadith recorded in Shahih that uh, Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was done with shahar. They all, uh, whoever believe this hadith as sahih are doing shirk and they are uh, mushrik. What is the right uh, explanation for this? We just bring one ayah of the Quran. وَمَا هُمْ بِضَارِينَ بِهِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ they, do, they don't harm anybody except by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do not believe that this magic has the ability. Rather, all, mag all abilities from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has allowed it to happen as a test. And... How can you say that this hadith which is in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, on the authority of Aisha radiallahu anha, whoever says that the Messenger alayhi salam had magic done on him, are we then accusing those two angels, the angels who had the conversation, and one said to the other, what's wrong with him? And the other said he has magic done on him. Are we saying they committed shirk, a'udhu billah? So this is a, a, a false concept and this is absolutely rejected. We do not say that there's any force except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, we say they do not harm anybody. Magic does not harm anybody except by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it has its effects. 
by the permission of Allah. This is why we turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone because He has power over all things subhanahu wa ta'ala. The brother asks about the magic shows, the magicians, etc. Akhi, like I mentioned, magic is one of the most hated things to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is that for which He has decreed that the person should be beheaded. And we as Muslims, we love what Allah and His Messenger love and we hate what Allah and His Messenger hate. So when you call a magician to your child's aqiqah, we don't do birthday parties, remember. When you call your, a magician to your child's aqiqah or your child has memorized the Quran or he's memorized Juz Amma and you want to throw a party, whatever it is, and you call a magician, what are you doing? You are desensitizing your child to magic. Rather, we need to teach our children this is the most disgusting or amongst the most disgraceful things and most hated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On this point, we have to deal with the movie Harry Potter. In this movie Harry Potter, those people who don't do magic, they are seen, I think are they called muggles or something like this, they are seen as those who are lowly, those who are like a, a disgraced type of creature. They're just normal people. The magicians and the wizards and the witches, they are from the highest echelons of society. Ikhwani, no. No. If you let your child watch this, you are desensitizing your child to that which is hated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Would you allow your child to watch something where they are saying kufr and shirk is all okay? Of course you wouldn't. Of course you wouldn't. This is the same thing, allowing them to watch magic, these magic shows, etc. Illusionary magic on TV, absolutely forbidden. Absolutely forbidden. On this point, the scholars have mentioned that we know the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, where he says, "Whoever visits a fortune teller, whoever visits a fortune teller, and he doesn't believe in what he says. You know these people who read your palms, and these people who look at your star signs, etc." The Messenger ﷺ said, whoever visits a fortune teller but does not believe in what he has said, his prayer will not be accepted from him for 40 days. You still need to pray to be, remain a Muslim, but your prayer will not be accepted. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he said, whoever visits a fortune teller and believes in what he has said, he has disbelieved in what was revealed to Muhammad ﷺ. The scholars mention fortune telling is a branch of magic because the, the, the magician is seeking the aid from the shayateen as we've mentioned how they make the chain up to the heavens they try and listen and then they bring it down and they put a hundred lies with that this is a chain or this is a branch of magic so they said even watching magic even watching magic but not believing that the magician has this ability your prayer will not be accepted for 40 days because the hadith of the fortune teller, it still applies. And they said, if you believe, the brother who asked me about the, the people who say that we, you know, the, the shirk about those who say that the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they say he committed, you know, we commit shirk if we say magic is real, etc. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, if, and if you believe that he has that ability, then you have disbelieved. Then you have disbelieved. So we have to be very, very, very careful in watching these things. Sheikh Muqbil Rahimahullah from Yemen, he said it's not permissible to watch these things. He said because at the moment that you are watching that magic, your eyes are being bewitched. And if your eyes are bewitched, the eyes are the gateway to the heart. And it may take hold in your heart, causing you to leave the fold of Islam. So we have to be very careful, we have to fear this and stay away from this in its entirety. The person who is doing the magic, we mentioned that the, the shari uh, punishment for him is to have his head chopped off. But we, he then asks the question, what about somebody who is a non-Muslim? He then becomes a Muslim. Is it the same thing that applies to him? The answer is absolutely not. The question that we mentioned, or the, the point that we mentioned, Sheikh Ibn Baz, Ibn Uthaymeen and others amongst the scholars, they said, if he's caught whilst he's practicing the magic, and then he says, I've repented. As for if he's repented, then it's not for him to go to the Muslim court and say, look, I used to practice magic, now I've repented. His repentance between him and Allah, he stopped. So therefore he's sincere, Therefore his tawbah will be accepted inshallah When he accepts Islam, all of his slate is wiped clean He starts fresh So uh, inshallah there's, there's no, uh, there's no uh, problems there inshallah The brother asks, has there been an increase in the, the number of cases? And what's the, what's the demographics of those who are involved? 
or those who are afflicted, those who are afflicted. The first thing is absolutely there has been an increase in this in the number of people who are afflicted. Absolutely, there's been an increase in the number of people who are afflicted. Ikhwani, what we have to realize is that when disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes up and knowledge comes down, part of the side effect of this is that the level of people who are possessed, the level of people who are suffering with magic, this goes up. So as ignorance and disobedience goes up, direct color, co uh, correlation, the number of, number of people who are afflicted, this also increases. Because this is one of the ways of disobedience. So just as zina and riba and murder increases, magic is also on the increase. Magic is also on the increase. As for the demographics of those who are afflicted, 85% of them are our sisters. 85% of them are our sisters. And the vast majority are from the age of about 20 to about 40. About 20 to about 40. So they're fairly young people. This is when people, this is when they're, you know, uh, traditionally or, or usually the most, uh, let's say, productive in their work, people want to put an end to that. This is when they are usually looking to get married, people want to put a block on that. This is usually when they have married, people want to split the husband and wife. So between the age of about 20 and about 40, this is the most, uh, the most of, let's say, common ages and, and our sisters are afflicted the most. How do we tell the difference between that which is psychological and psychotic and that which is uh, jinn possession? Um, I want to mention something which occurred with this brother who, who again, he is a, a good practicing brother and he's reliable. A, a, a non-Muslim girl is sitting around a table and there's five doctors who are all around her. Five doctors are all around her. One of the doctors is Muslim and the other doctors, they are non-Muslim. This is in the UK. The girl says, I can see ants. Ants, silver ants, and they are walking all over you, except for you. And she points to the Muslim. And the Muslim brother asks, why? She says, because you, you prayed this morning before the sun rose, referring to Fajr prayer. And as a result of that Fajr prayer, this was a protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I just mentioned this because there are always external things. If there is a, you know, a, 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 for example, uh, a psychotic issue and the person is mentally afflicted, they will usually respond well to the medicine. So the medicine will bring them an element of benefit. So for example, you, you'll know a direct link between we put the dosage up and the person, we, you know, when we get to the optimum dosage, the person reacts well. But then when we take them off, their signs and symptoms continue. When somebody is usually possessed, you can put them on dosage after dosage after dosage and every time you put them on that dosage, it's not enough. They will have a, a, a period where they seem to be docile, but then subhanAllah, they need more and they need more and they need more and more and more. And then until no drug is effective, until you are putting them on so much medicine that they just become like a vegetable, they don't speak anymore, all they do is sleep all night. In this situation, it's usually going to be jinn. Why? Because that jinn was sent to destroy the person's life in putting him under so many sedatives, so, much, so many drugs. What have you done? You've destroyed that person's life. Now he doesn't even speak. He sleeps all day. He stays awake all night. He can't pray five times a day. He can't make dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He can't follow the sunnah. He can't practice his religion. He can't have a wife, etc. This has destroyed his life. If, if, if a person has passed away, um, is there any way to find out whether they have had sihr done to them? The answer is no. There's no way to find out. But then as Muslims, we also have to ask ourselves, what would it benefit as well? Um, I, 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 and I'll use this as a, as a proof to this point that we as Muslims, we stay away from that which doesn't really concern us because it doesn't benefit us. A group of men came to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he asked, a man asked, O Messenger of Allah, when is the hour? When is the day of resurrection coming? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him very simply, what have you prepared for it? Why have you prepared for it? So the point here is that it doesn't really benefit us to know that this person was afflicted or not afflicted because their affair is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is one situation which is a type of magic which is hereditary and it is done on an entire family and it moves from mother to child to child to child to child until somebody breaks that book, until you do ruqya in that situation. But as for knowing whether that individual uh, actually had sihr on them, 
um, it wouldn't actually bring us any benefit and there's no way that I know of uh, nor mention the Quran or Sunnah which is, is, is able to, um, uh, you know, we're able to tell, we're able to tell. We like to give charity, we like to give our clothes to, and we send them to, you know, uh, less privileged places. Is it possible that these clothes can be used to perform sihar on us, to do magic on us? The answer is absolutely yes. They can be used to perform magic on you. Of course, the way to get around this is you send it to those individuals who you trust. You send it, if you ever suspect an individual that this person is not practicing or they have this hatred or envy, then I advise you to stay away from that. I advise you to stay away from that. Or give the clothes to a charity and just give them to a charity so that it's an anonymous. Nobody knows that they're your clothes. Nobody knows that they've come directly from yourself. This way you can still go to, I don't know if it's this way in, in here, but in the UK we can go to a charity shop, give our clothes to the charity shop, and then we can say, I want these clothes to go to Africa, to Asia, to Palestine, etc. So I advise you to do it that way. If you fear that somebody from amongst your own family is doing it, then of course, don't give them the bullets and say, here, shoot me with it, you know? So stay away from that. Don't, don't go down uh, that, that route. How, how can we avoid this? This is also applicable to a situation where you have been invited to somebody's house and you're about to eat their food, but you're not sure. Maybe this person is about to do magic on me now. Maybe, you know, this, this person has an element of hatred, but the food is in front of you. And if you don't eat, it's going to cause big fitna, it's going to separate two families, they're going to say, why you don't eat, etc. What do you do in this situation? The answer is, Akhi, place your trust in Allah, say Bismillah, and then eat. Place your trust in Allah, say Bismillah, send your food, send your clothes. Because if there is sihar, it's not going to be able to affect you, except with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So place your trust in Allah. It's like when Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu an, the, 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 the man said, look, you know, you've been besieging this fort, he's besieging the city. And the man said, look, drink this poison, drink this poison. And if you can drink it and you survive, then we'll allow you into our town. Khalid ibn Walid, Bismillah, he tawakkal to Allah, he drinks it and nothing happens. This is because he placed his trust in Allah. You know, we have, to take, we have to free our minds from this shackle. When Ibrahim السلام, was going to slaughter his son, Allah did not give the knife the ability to cut. When he was in the fire, Allah did not give the ability to the fire to burn him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who decrees all things. He is the one with whose permission all of these things happen. So place your trust in Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you inshaAllah. Okay, we'll ask a question about the dreams. If you've been dreaming, um, I'll mention it briefly because uh, just just briefly, but dreams are a, are a sign from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Uh, inshallah, I think we'll end on, on this one. We know that there are three types of dreams. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us there's three types of three types of dreams. One type of dream is you see a you see a red Ferrari during the day. You dream about the red Ferrari at night. This is just mumblings of your mind. You've seen something during the day and you dream about it at night. This is mumblings of the mind. There's no real significance to this whatsoever. The second type of dream is that dream which is from shaitan. Shaitan comes to you in your dream, he tries to scare you in your dream, tries to mislead you in your dream. This is shaitan trying to lead you astray. The third type of dream is that which is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is one of the parts of prophethood that we have. We have access to only one part of prophethood that we as Muslims have, as we as, as people, individuals we have. This is the true dream. Through your dreams, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows you if you are afflicted. So if you are always seeing uh, dogs, uh, if you are always seeing dogs, you are always seeing snakes in your dreams and they are attacking you, you are always seeing blood all around you. you there's certain dreams, and inshallah we'll talk about them in more detail tomorrow, inshallah. But certain dreams is a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ultimately, if you think that there's any possibility of you being afflicted, do the ruqya on yourself. It's not going to bring you any harm. Recitation of Qur'an never brought about any harm whatsoever. It's only going to bring you benefit. If at the very least, for every single letter that you recite, 10 good deeds. So subhanAllah, there's a lot of benefit. There's a lot of benefit. So just, you know, it's better to be safe than sorry. So just take a mushaf or take the ayat of ruqya, sit down and just make ruqya on yourself. As for if a husband or, or a wife are afflicted, should this relationship continue? I say absolutely yes. 
absolutely yes, it should continue. Rather, it should bring you closer together and you should both seek a cure together. And this is a form of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala together and getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should not end the marriage because your marriage never really had an ability or never really had the chance to flourish because there was always an external influence. So seek a cure and inshallah you never know later on you two might be the best of companions in dunya and in jannah inshallah. Okay, we'll end there inshallah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.